What's up my stats stars? Welcome to my top 10 video for AP Statistics Unit 2 Exploring Two Variable Data. In this video I'm going to cover the top 10 most important concepts that you need to know coming out of Unit 2 that's going to help you not only ace your Unit 2 test in class but also do really really well on the AP exam in May. Now before I dive into the top 10 tips, let me first remind you of the ultimate review pack that I've created just for you. If you want to do well in class, if you want to do well in the exam, you need to practice. And that's exactly what the ultimate review packet for AP Statistics does for you. You can get a free trial and it gives you study guides, practice multiple choice, practice FRQs, full length practice tests at the end of the year, everything you need to prepare for every single unit and for the entire course. There's a free trial, so check it out now. There's a lot Lots of also really cool exclusive videos that are going to help you prepare and these top 10 videos are eventually going to not be free on YouTube. You're going to have to join the Ultimate Review Packet to get them for the rest of the year. So hopefully you enjoy it, check it out, I think you're going to love it. Let's dive into the top 10 tips. Tip number one, be careful with proportions from categorical data. For example, if you take a look at this segmented bar graph, we see the breakdown of kids that were tardy and kids that were not tardy to school one day and how they got to school, whether by bus, parent, self-drive, or walk. Now when you see a relative frequency segmented bar graph like this, one thing that you might see is some questions. For example, is the following statement guaranteed to be true? A higher number of students that drive themselves to school are tardy compared to the students that ride the bus. Now a lot of kids will just look at this and they'll say, okay, tardy's red. They're going to look at the kids that drive themselves. They're going to look at the kids that ride the bus. They're going to say, oh, the red section for the kids that drive themselves is way bigger than the red section for kids that ride the bus. This is a true statement. But the problem is that we're looking at relative frequencies, which are proportions. And the problem says a higher number of students. So the deal is that just because a proportion from one group is higher than another doesn't mean that the number of people in that group is going to be higher because we don't know the sample sizes. So if we were told that a thousand kids ride the bus, 10%, that's roughly what that red area is for those that ride the bus, 10% of a thousand is about a hundred. Whereas if we only knew that 50 kids drive themselves to school and it looks to be about 55% of kids are tardy, that's that red area for kids that drive themselves, well 55% of 50 is about 28. So in that case this statement would actually be wrong, there's not a higher number of students. There is a higher proportion, but not a higher number. So all I could say is be very, very careful when you're comparing proportions without knowing the size of the groups that those proportions came from. Tip number two, know how to determine if there is an association between two categorical variables by looking at a two-way table. This is an extremely important topic that's definitely going to be on your Unit 2 test and definitely going to be on the AP exam. Let's take a look at an example here. So going back to looking at kids that are tardy and not tardy and how they got to school, we see all the numbers here. Now how can I determine if there's an association between how I get to school and if I'm tardy or not by looking at this chart? Well, it starts with knowing your marginal distributions versus your total or conditional distributions. So for example, if we dive into this, we see that the marginal distribution for the proportion of kids that are tardy, this is all the kids that are tardy, 65 out of 180 is about 34.6%, so roughly 35% of kids are tardy. So now what I need to do to determine if there's an association between being tardy and how I got to school, I got to look at those conditional relative frequencies. So looking at only the kids that ride the bus. So of the bus riders, 12 out of 35 are tardy. That's about 34.3%. Of the kids that get to school by a parent, 10 out of 29, about 34.5%. Of the kids that drive themselves, 31 out of 90, about 34%. And of the kids that walk to school, it's 12 out of 34, 35%. So what I'm noticing is that, again, the marginal number is roughly about 34-ish percent of all kids are tardy to school. And if you look at the bus riders, it's about 34%. Look at the kids that arrive by parent, about 34%. Look at kids that drive themselves, about 34%. And look at the kids that walk, pretty darn close to 34%. So this would tell me that there is not an association. It doesn't appear that if you ride the bus or go to school with your parent or you walk, it makes you any more or less likely. It looks like it's about a 34% um, pro proportion of being tardy no matter what. Here's a, a segmented bar graph, excuse me, segmented bar graph that actually shows this as well. We see that the sections that are tardy for each group are about the same, showing that how you get to school doesn't matter, which means these two things are not related. 
Whereas in this example, same, same exact setup, just different numbers, we can take a look at the marginal relative frequency first as well. Here we see 65 total kids out of 188. Again, about 34% were targeted to school. But now if we break it down by of those that ride the bus, it's about 11%. Of those that come with the parents, about 17%. Of those that drive themselves, it's about 53%. And of those that walk, there are 23%. So what we notice is some major changes. 34% of kids are tardy. However, if you ride the bus, much less likely to be tardy. If you drive yourself, much more likely to be tardy. This is where we see that there is an association. Apparently, if I take the bus to school, I'm less likely to be tardy. If I drive myself, I'm more likely, 53%. So it's really important that you recognize when you see the same proportions across the board, that's a sign that there is no association. But when you see them changing, that means there is an association. So always start by looking at that marginal distribution and comparing it to the conditional to determine if there's an association or not. Pretty important thing and a pretty easy task as well, but you got to know how to do it. Tip number three, you have to know how to describe a scatter plot. When you see a scatter plot, you're definitely going to be asked to describe what you see. And when you describe a scatter plot, there are four hugely important things that you have to mention. The direction of the scatter plot, the form of the scatter plot, the strength of the scatter plot, and you got to talk about that scatter plot in context, meaning use words from the problem. So here is an example where we are looking at turkeys. We're looking at a sample of 12 male turkeys. We looked at the length of their beard, not their little uh, gobbler or whatever that is. I'm talking about they actually have like a little beard of feathers or something. I don't know. But we're looking at the length of that beard and their weight. And we clearly see a relationship here. So what do we see? We see positive. As the length of the beard goes up, so does the weight. We could also have a negative relationship where as x goes up, y goes down. That's not what we're seeing here. We also want to look at the form. We see that it's creating, creating like a line, linear, right? A linear form means that there is a constant rate of change. That means as one goes up, the other one goes up at a constant rate. That's really important that you understand that's what linear means. We also look at the strength. The strength is established by how closely those points form that direction and that form. And then lastly, we want to talk about this in context, basically saying, hey, I noticed that as the length of the beard of a turkey goes up, so does its weight, or there's a tendency for its weight to go up. So putting it all together, I'm going to say hey, that this graph is positive. It's pretty strong, it's linear, and it definitely shows that as the bird uh, turkey beard length goes up, so does its weight. But you got to make sure you know how to analyze those four things when you take a look at a scatter plot. Tip number four is all about correlation. You have to know what it is, you have to know how to find it, and you got to know how to interpret it. So let's first talk about what correlation is, because so many people misuse it. Correlation is a very specific value that determines the direction and the strength of a linear relationship between two quantitative variables. So first off, the variables have to be quantitative. If one of your variables is categorical, you cannot use the word correlation. That's just terrible use of vocabulary words. I actually hear people doing it all the time. Don't do it. Next up is your data has to be somewhat linear. If your data isn't somewhat linear, if your scatter plot doesn't kind of look like a line, we would never use correlation to measure it. Correlation is specific for linear data. Finally, correlation does measure direction because it can be positive or it could be negative. Positive means the direction of your data is going up. Negative means the direction of your data is going down. Now, Correlation has a lot of cool features, but a couple of the most important ones is it's guaranteed to be a number from negative one to positive one, inclusive. Negative one means you have a perfect negative straight line. Positive one means you have a perfect positive straight line. The closer your correlation is to zero, the weaker you are. The closer you get to negative one or positive one, the stronger the relationship in that direction. Now, there are no units on correlation either, so make sure you don't ever tag something on there as well. But knowing what correlation measures and how you get it is super important. Now, there is a really ugly formula for correlation that you really don't have to worry much about at all for AP statistics because you're usually going to be given the correlation and just ask what it means, or you're going to be able to find it on some type of technology like a calculator or a computer. Tip number five, know the least squares regression line. First, you need to know the formula for the least squares regression line. Y hat equals A plus B X. We put that little hat on the Y so we know it's a predicted value. A is the Y intercept, B is the slope, and X is the explanatory variable. All you got to do is take a given X value, plug it in, and you will get a predicted Y value. Pretty easy to use. Just note that it cannot work the other way around. 
even though algebraically can and statistics we would not do that. You can't plug a y hat in and solve for an x. No, 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 no. Also be careful with extrapolation. You cannot plug in an x value that's outside of the data that generated the least squares regression line as well. Now, why is it the best line, not just any old line? Well, that's because it has the smallest sum of the square residuals. So the residual is the distance between an actual point and the actual predicted line that the line predicts, right? So it's the distance between the line and the actual point. Some are positive, some are negative. Now, if we square all these residual values and add them all together, we're going to get a number. And the least squares regression line, the best line, the sum of those square residuals is smaller than any other line. That's what makes it the best. Now, how do we find this line? Well, best case scenario, I just give it to you, right? And that actually happens quite often on the AP exam. Second best scenario is that we give it to you through what's called a computer output table that we're going to talk about in a later tip. And then the third case is probably the worst for the student, but it's actually not that bad, is you actually have to calculate it. Here we're going to use the formulas to find slope and the y-intercept. The formula to find b is taking your correlation r, multiplying it by the standard deviation of all of your y-values, divided by the standard deviation of all of your x-values. Then to find the y-intercept, you're going to take your average y, the average of all the y-values, minus your slope, so you do have to find slope first, times the average of all of our x values. Now listen, the only time on the AP exam that you're going to be required to use these formulas is if they also give you all this information. They're going to give you the average x and y, the standard deviation for the x and y, and the correlation. So they're never going to ask you to do it unless they give you all the tools you need to actually do it. Now for our example with the turkeys, here is how we actually went ahead and calculated the least squares regression line. And I had the data, so I was able to get the standard deviation for y and x, and I was able to get the average for x and the average for y that allowed me to generate this formula right here in front of you. But that is exactly what the least squares regression line is. Just know how to use it and know why it is the best line. Tip number six, know how to interpret the slope of a least squares regression line. This is always good for at least one multiple choice question and maybe even an FRQ on the AP exam. So first off, the slope is b. I like to make it a fraction by putting it over 1. Even if it's a decimal, you can make it a fraction by putting it over 1. Now, what does b tell you? It tells you how much we predict the y variable to change based on a change of one unit in the x variable. Pretty simple. So in our turkey problem, we calculated the slope to be 7.052. This is, can be actually set a couple different ways, but basically it says that we predict the weight of a turkey to go up by 7.052 pounds based on every one inch increase in that turkey's beard length. So beard length goes up an inch, we predict that the weight's going to go up 7.052 pounds. Pretty simple, but you got to make sure you can write it. A couple of different ways to write it, but you got to be able to interpret it. It's a very important thing that you need to be able to do for the exam. Tip number seven, know how to interpret the y-intercept. The y-intercept is the a value. So generically, the y-intercept is what we predict the y variable to be when x equals zero. Not too bad. Now, sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. That's just something that happens with the y-intercept. Don't worry about it if it doesn't make sense or not. Now, in our problem, the y-intercept was negative 8.53. That tells us that when a turkey has a beard length of 0 inches, which I guess is possible, there could be a turkey without a beard, that we would predict its weight to be negative 8.53 pounds, which that would actually be impossible. A turkey couldn't have a negative weight. So again, like I said, sometimes the y-intercept doesn't make sense in context. Doesn't mean it's calculated wrong, it just is what it is, mostly due to extrapolation. None of our data had a beard length near zero, which is why the value that we would get if we had a beard length of zero doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but no big deal, it is what it is, but you better know how to interpret the y-intercept. Tip number eight, is a least squares regression line appropriate? You need to know how to answer that question. Now, to determine if a least squares regression line is appropriate for your data, there are two things you have to take a look at. First, you got to take a look at the original scatter plot. Does the original scatter plot look somewhat linear? If you see a giant curve in the original scatter plot, you should not be trying to use a line to make predictions for that data. Absolutely not. 
But the second thing we need to take a look at is the residual plot. The residual plot is a plot of our residual values versus our x values. And when we look at a residual plot, we want to see nothing, no pattern whatsoever. This is a really good thing. This means that our line is going through our data, and if our line is going through our data, there's going to be positive residuals, there's going to be negative residuals, there's going to be small residuals, there's going to be big residuals, and there's going to be small and big and positive and negative residuals throughout. That actually means our line is going through the data. If your line is trying to go through a curve, then the residuals are actually going to form a pattern, which means that a least squares regression line is not appropriate. So we want our original scatter plot to be somewhat straight, somewhat linear, and we want our residual plot to show no pattern. Those are all signs that a least squares regression line is appropriate for your data. Tip number nine, is a least squares regression line reliable when it comes to making predictions? This is another fantastic question that you have to be able to answer. To answer it, it comes down to understanding two values. R squared, also known as the coefficient of determination, is the first thing. R squared is an actual percentage of variation in the Y variable that is explained by the variation in the X variable. So R squared actually tells you how tied together these two variables are. So in our example, we see that there's a very high R squared number. We see that 89.5% of the variation in the actual weight of the turkeys is explained by the variation in the beard length of the turkeys. So we see a strong connection between, two our, between our two variables, which means that it's very reliable to use our line to make a prediction for y with the given x. Now the second thing that will help us determine if the least squares regression line is reliable is s. s is the standard deviation of the residuals. Okay, what S is going to measure for you is when you use your line to make a prediction, it's basically telling you how far off you're typically going to be. No prediction is going to be perfect. Some might be kind of high, some might be kind of low, but listen, the standard deviation of the residuals S tells you typically how far your prediction is off. So we would like to have a small S value. This means when we make predictions, we're usually off only by a little bit. Now, with our example here, we see an S value of 2.25 pounds. That means when we're trying to predict the weight of a turkey based on the turkey's length of its beard, we're only off by about 2.25 pounds on average. That's actually pretty good when it comes to the weight of a turkey. So yeah, it's not perfect. We'd like to be off by only like a half a pound, but hey, it is what it is. It's better than being off by 10 pounds, which is half the weight of most turkeys. So not too bad, but understanding that reliability comes from looking at a high R squared value, coefficient determination, and a low S value, standard deviation of the residuals. Tip number 10, the last tip, is know how to read and interpret a linear regression output table. Now listen, essentially what this table is, it comes from a computer program. You dump all of your data in and everything out that you possibly need will come out of this table. So these tables are very important because they're all over the AP exam. You just need to know to find what you're looking for. So when we look at one of these tables, the first two things we're looking for are the y-intercept and the slope. And they're both very easy to find. They're in the very first column marked coefficients and they go in alphabetical order, A on top of B. So we look at the table here, we see A, that's our y-intercept, negative 8.53 and our slope is right underneath it 7.05. Now you actually don't need the other columns the SC, the t-score, the p-value we don't need them right now in unit 2. We'll use them later on in unit 9 but right now you don't need them at all. The other two values that you're going to see in these tables that are important to you is the R squared 0.895 and the S value that we just got done talking about 2.25. Now when you see one of these tables what you need to be able to do is create the least squares regression line. All you got to do is take y hat equals a negative 8.53 plus b 7.052 times x and voila you're done. And then if you're asked about reliability you could go ahead and use the R squared and the S value to make sure that you understand what those values tell you as well. But any computer output table like this is awesome because it gives you everything you need. All right, that's it for the top 10 tips coming out of Unit 2 for AP Statistics. If you watch this video, I think it'll really help you prepare for your unit tests in class, as well as help you review and prepare for the AP exam in May. Don't forget to check out my Ultimate Review Pack if you're looking for tons more great material to help you practice and prepare. See you in the next video.